Well, good morning, Freedom Church. Nah, come on, let's try this again. Come on, good morning, Freedom Church. Oh, that's awesome. I love it. Man, I love the worship that's in the house. I love the presence of God that's here. Can I just pray over us real quick, just for the next few moments, that God would cover us and that he would speak to us in a mighty way. Is that all right, everybody? So, God, right now, I thank you for your word that's about to go forth. I thank you, God, for being able to be a vessel that you can speak through. And, Lord, just for the next few moments, I just want your word to be planted into all of our hearts. And, God, as you speak to us, I pray if there's any opposition that might come against your church, God, I pray against that. In the name of Jesus right now, I believe all things are possible because we serve a great big God and we love you, Jesus. And everybody said amen. 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 I got a question for you real quick. Does anybody know what Fridays are for? Fridays are for closing. This past Friday, we close on 1711 Conowingo Road. Come on, come on, somebody. Awesome. Let's give, the, let's give the next picture where it shows the footprint of, where, if you guys missed last week, we made an announcement that we were pursuing the properties, two properties to the left of us, my right this morning. And because your generosity, we were able to step forward through that goal and that, that just amazing just gift that's been placed in front of us. So thank you, church. Come on, Freedom Church. Give yourselves a great hand. I love it. <clears throat> we get to expand, and when we expand, we see people come to know Jesus, and so it's going to be amazing. And we're going to keep you from cussing as you leave church because the parking lot is crowded. All right. So you guys are generous people, and, I, and I'm so, so, so grateful. Today we're going to continue our selfless series and I just want to take a quick poll real quick, if I can, uh, before we dive in. Many of you fly a lot, and I know that you probably fly for business, and, and maybe some just like to fly. And I'm just curious, um, when you get on a plane, and if you have your choice of seat like me, because most of the time I fly southwest, and we call that the cattle guard of the skies. They do not have assigned seating at southwest, and for all you Delta, you know, fans, American United, you know, you guys that travel at a whole different level, you get seat assignments. But if you don't, and you have a choice of your seat, how many would choose, by the lifting of your hand, just agree with the church today that if you had your choice, you would pick an aisle seat? Come on. All you holy people. These are the righteous people. All right, awesome. How many like the window seat? Wow, that's amazing. Remember that in a few moments. How many unsaved people like to get in that middle seat? Quick story, quick story, real quick. Um, I was flying back a couple weeks ago from somewhere, and I'm on Southwest, and I'm like, I was, I had the, the luxury of being able to be the first, one of the first groups that get on the airplane. And as soon as I, and one of my favorite seats on the airplane is what they call the bulkhead. That's the first row, the first seat. And because um, all that leg room, and you can really have your space. And so, you know, they made it very clear, hey, this flight is not full, so be able to get on the flight, take, you know, find you a seat. You're not going to have anything going on. This flight is not full, right? And so I get onto the airplane. <coughs> Sorry, I had a coughing burst right before I got up here. And I find my seat on the front row, and another person who was kind of kind of big person found their seat up against the window, and we're like, okay, I'm good with that. I mean, we, got a, we got the space in between. We're like fist bumping, like we got this row, we got it held down, this plane is not even half full, y'all, and all of a sudden this big guy comes onto the plane, and guess where he sits, right between us, and I am so angry, I'm like, dude, you're a fool, this plane, there, you can have your own row, but you choose to get right between us, and here we are just kind of smushed up together for three hours, it was not fun at all. Well, this, this series is called Selfless. What a great segue. <clears throat> and it's all about making life less about me, less about you, and more about God and others. Jesus said that the greatest person in the kingdom of God is the one who serves. The <clears throat> oh, my goodness. The one that puts others ahead of themselves. But isn't that so radically different from the world that we live in? I mean, if you research this idea of selfishness, you may come across this article. If you Google it, you'll probably come across it. It says this, that science shows us that we are selfish. 
And I thought this was kind of funny because I don't need science to tell me that we're selfish. All I need to do is drive through Bel Air in the month of December. How many know what I'm talking about? Right? Or, or, or just let me look at your two-year-old for about ten minutes. Right? You never have to have a selfish class for a two-year-old. Like, boys and girls, today I'm going to teach you how to be selfish. Right? I'm going to give you your toy. And when I do, when I take it away, I want you to scream to the very top of your lungs like mine and then throat punch me at the same time. You never have to have that conversation. It just comes naturally, right? And by nature, you can look around our world, you can look around our society, you can look around our culture, and you see people that are extremely inherently selfish. A minute ago, I asked you what seat you would like to choose if you were walking onto an airplane. And here's the truth. According to some studies, people who choose the aisle seat tend to be more social and more generous. Or you have a small bladder. What seat you choose tells a whole lot about you as you travel the blue skies, right? People who choose the window seat tend to prefer isolation and are more selfish. In fact, Dr. Becky Spellman says this. Passengers who favor the window seat like to be in control. Over half of this church are control freaks. <laughs> You raised your hand, I didn't. <laughs> they tend to take an every man for themselves kind of attitude toward life and often are more easily irritable. They also like to nest and prefer to exist in their own bubble. And some of the research even reveals that for the most part, men, I'm coming after you, men are more selfish than women. I apologize, guys, I'm one of you. All the ladies, where are you at? But apparently, you ladies are more hardwired to have a nurturing spirit. And it's more natural for women to put others first. Right, ladies? A couple of you. Amen. I like that. And it gets worse for guys who like to work out. One study from Harvard says that spending more time in the gym is linked to a more selfish socioeconomic worldview. So there you go. If any of you guys are looking for excuses not to work out, here's the best one. You don't want to be a terrible person. <laughs> but ladies, you're not off the hook when it comes to selfishness. Men aren't the only ones that selfish. When it comes to chocolate, it's every woman for themselves. <laughs> and studies are clear that if a woman is with her best friend... And has a choice between a bigger piece of chocolate cake or a smaller piece of chocolate cake. She will straight up elbow her best friend in the face and take the bigger piece of cake every time. And all the ladies said. <laughs> You're like, that's right. Where's the chocolate cake? You know, our culture can be so selfish. Gratify yourself. Indulge yourself. Get whatever you can get. Get what's yours. Run after the ring. It's all about you. But Jesus gives us a different way to live. He gives us a much better way to live. He says, if you want to be my disciple, don't indulge yourself. Don't make it all about you. But start, rather, by denying yourself and start putting someone else in front of you. And when you look at the life of Jesus, you see this consistent theme throughout his life on earth, Jesus was never about consuming, but rather he was about contributing. Jesus always put others first. For Jesus, in fact, his greatest joy, his greatest fulfillment came from doing what his Father in heaven wanted him to do. And we're going to find out, we're going to hang out in John 4. In John 4, you can, you can go to your scripture of that on, on that right now, or you can wait. It'll be on the screen in a little bit. But in John 4, let me paraphrase just for a second. Jesus had this life-changing encounter with who we call the woman at the well. Uh, it was in Samaria. She runs into town after being with Jesus, and she tells everybody about Jesus. I find it interesting that when you have a true encounter with Jesus... 
you want to tell everybody about him. When you have a true encounter with Jesus, you want to protect him. You want to protect his church, and you want to tell everybody about his life-changing power. Can I get a good amen? So she did this. She ran into Samaria. She began to talk about Jesus. And a revival, a little revival began to break out. And a ton of people began to follow Jesus and come out and meet him. And his disciples catch up with Jesus. And the following conversation took place. John chapter 4. Meanwhile, everybody say meanwhile. The disciples were urging Jesus, Jesus, you need to eat something. Turn to your neighbor and say, you need to eat something. I'm hungry. <laughs> but Jesus replied, as only he can, uh, guys, I kind of have a food that you know nothing about. And they're like, what? I mean, did someone come and sneak him some food while we were gone? The guys are like, hey, did someone slip him some five guys and we weren't looking? Now everybody's going to five guys after church. Right. Then Jesus explained. My nourishment comes from doing the will of God who sent me from finishing his work. In fact, Jesus was saying, guys, it's not five guys, it's not Taco Bell, it's not Burger King or McDonald's. My food, my nourishment is something else. When everyone else is thinking about, fill me, fill me up, feed me, what actually fills me, Jesus is saying, is to fill others. What nourishes me is to pour into the life of someone else to do the work of God and to finish the work that he's asked me to do. Guys, I have food that you know nothing about. What fills me is doing the work of God and ministering to other people. You know, there's a contrast between Jesus and his disciples. There, there's a great difference between his followers and him and, and, who, and his disciples who, is, who are concerned about consumption. They were all about, you know what, we need to consume, we need to take in, we need to be filled up. we got to take care of ourselves, and the, the people can wait. We need to eat something. But Jesus was not concerned about consuming. He was concerned with contributing. When he contributed into the lives of others, this is what filled him up. This is what nourished him in a way that sometimes we might miss. And by nature... Let me just be honest with you. By nature, I can be, if I'm not dialed into my relationship with Jesus, I can be the most self-centered, I can be the most selfish person on planet earth. And I know you can too. And Jesus is saying, guys, I have a higher calling. I I've got a higher destiny than just thinking about me right now. I'm going to contribute. I'm going to take my time on earth, and I am going to pay it forward. I am going to contribute into the life of others. You know, that's a big deal for today, isn't it? Because we are not spiritual consumers. Freedom Church, we are called to be spiritual contributors. Why? Because we understand that the church does not exist for us, but rather, we are the church and we exist for the world. I was hoping for a bigger or stronger amen on that. Can I get a better amen on that, somebody? That statement changes everything. That's who we are. We are spiritual contributors. Why are we spiritual contributors? Because we understand that the church does not exist for us but you. Turn to your neighbor and say, man, you're a good-looking church. I like your steeple. Open up your mouth and let me see your people. You're a good-looking church. You are the church. The church is not brick and mortar. It's not carpet and stage and lighting. You are the church, and we exist for a broken and fallen world. Amen. That's our spiritual nourishment. That's our five guys. That's our food. Speaking of food, how many remember... Way back. I'm going to go way back on you, all right? I'm going to go way, way back. 1970. McDonald's had an advertising jingle about the Big Mac. Two all-beef patties. Come on, finish it. Special sauce. Lettuce. And let the church say. It was a promise. 
if you walked into McDonald's and you ordered a Big Mac, that's what you would get. Two all beef patties, special sauce. Praise the Lord for the special sauce. Lettuce, cheese, pickles, onions on a sesame seed bun. No other bun will do. Every single time, guaranteed. Then something happened at another restaurant that literally started to change the fast food industry. Some of you remember the moment. Some of you remember what you were wearing. Some of you remember where you were standing. Who's JFK? This is what happened. The year, 1973. Burger King changed everything. Burger King came out with a slogan. What is it? Come on, have it your way. Before we ever had it your way, we walked in and we ordered a hamburger. This is what you got. Two, two tomatoes, four pickles, lettuce, onions, and that was it. But Burger King said, hold the pickle. You want lettuce? Special orders don't upset us. You could special order anything you want. And some of you are feeling really close to God right now. The Holy Spirit is really moving in your heart. And if you were born after the year of 2000, you're like, what are you talking about? I'm talking about something powerful. I'm talking about Book of Acts, Burger King. Trust me. Suddenly when you walked into Burger King, you were in control. You say, you know what? Not only do I want pickles, I want extra pickles. There's a guy that comes to this campus. He's not here today, bless his heart. His name is Rick Youngworth. And my man loves him some pickles. Every time I've ever gone out to eat with him, he's like, I'll take a pickle burger and you can add the meat. I'm like, dude, I'm sorry, you can have my pickles too. Right? You're in control. You're like, I want mayonnaise. I'm a mustard person. Any mustard people in the room? All right. Have it your way. All of a sudden, 1973, you are in charge. And now here we are some 40 years later, and the customer is king. Suddenly, the power has shifted to the consumer. Burger King realized that people have several choices of restaurant. And if we're going to compete, I, we've got to give the people what they want. Have it your way. And we've become over time an overly consumeristic society. And I, and I believe that's totally fine in the fast food industry. But if we're not careful, that mentality can creep into the spiritual realm. Now churches, not only do we have to worry about prayer, 21 days of prayer, we need to get the church praying. Got to get people in God's word. We need to understand who we are in the word of God. We need to find our identity in Jesus. But we have to think, well, what could be attractive to lost people? In fact, it's really common to encounter people. And it's okay. I get it. I understand it. And you think, well, they passed by and they saw a building that used to sell cars and now it's a church. And they come in and they're like, yeah, we're just, we're just kind of shopping for a church. We're just shopping around for a church. I'm looking for a church that fits, fits, and, and I'm not trying to down that. Maybe I don't think I am. Lord, help my heart if I do. But I, I just don't think that that was what God had in mind as he began to build his church. You're like, I've been to all 79 churches in Bel Air, and it's down to this one. Well, let me tell you, it doesn't get better. Then the first one, right? But oftentimes we have this mentality in a spiritual realm, like what's in it for me, right? And it's so incredibly common to kind of be consumeristic as it relates to your spiritual walk. But I do not believe that's, not, that's what Jesus had in mind when he started his church. God's dream for his church is not a bunch of selfish, self-centered, consumeristic people who show up on Sunday and check the box but do nothing to contribute to his dream. It's quiet. It's hot. Can I get a good amen? The description of the original blueprint for the church was a community of people who love God first and puts others before themselves. So what are we? 
Freedom Church. We are spiritual contributors, not consumers. Because we understand that the church does not exist for us, but we are the church, flesh and blood. We are the body of Christ, and we exist for the world. That's who we are, Freedom Church. I want to give you two really quick, easy points to remember and we're going we're gonna to go home. Number one, write this down if you can. God calls you to serve in his church. God calls you. If you're a follower of Jesus, you are gifted. You're called. And you're set apart to use your gifts to make a difference in his church. God never intended his church to be a building. God always intended his church to be his people. Let me say this again. The church is not a building. The church is his people. We don't go to church. We are the church. This movement, this community called the church didn't even start in a building. In fact, you may not know this. Here's a little fun fact for the day. But back in the day, churches didn't even own buildings. And people really couldn't even gather publicly until about 313 A.D. when Constantine passed a law legalizing Christianity. Jesus has come and gone some 300 years later. Oh, I'm a Christian. Before that time, Christians could not gather publicly in most places because it was illegal. And even now, many places throughout the world, right now, it's the same way. In Middle East and in China and North Korea... There's an underground church of millions of people uplifting the name of Jesus. Thank God for the United States of America. Thank God for the freedom that we have. Thank God we don't walk out and there's military asking, what are you doing in that building? Thank God we get to serve Jesus. Amen? We are the church. That's when you know you're the church is when you don't have a building. And as the church, we have a privilege and responsibility to serve. Everybody say serve. We used to say, if you're not serving, you're swerving, right? Romans 12 talks about this. gives us an awesome picture of how the gifts that we all have can contribute to God's church. Romans 12, 6 and 8. In his grace. You know, when it, talks, when it starts out, in his grace, you know you're taken care of. In his grace, God has given us. Different gifts. You, you, don't, you don't have your gifts because you get to brag on yourself. You don't have your gifts because you have a haughty spirit. You don't have your gifts because you're better than someone else. Oh, it's, it's in his grace. God has graced me with a gift. God has graced you with gifts. In his grace, God has given us different gifts for doing certain things well. So if God has given you the ability to prophesy, speak out as with much faith as God has given you. If your gift is serving others, serve them the best you can. If you're a teacher, teach well. If your gift is to encourage other, others, be encouraging. If it is giving, give generously. Oh my goodness, you guys gave generously last Sunday. And continue to give generously. Thank God for a generous church that can expand the kingdom, expand the footprint so that others, lost people, can know Jesus by the power of his, of his saving name. If God has given you leadership ability, take the responsibility seriously. And if you have a gift of showing kindness to others, do it gladly. So prophesy, serve, teach, encourage, give, lead, and have kindness. Seven different gifts. And you may not, well, Pastor Wade, I don't know what my gifting is. I've just been kind of floating here. I, I, I don't know what to do. The growth track is, you know, it's, 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 I'm trying to figure it all out. Let me, let me help you. Can I help you? i got a test that I think we can kind of nail down what your gifting is real quick. We call it the apple pie test. You guys like apple pie? Church, do you like apple pie? Do you like it with ice cream? Some people like bluebell ice cream. Some people like Turkey Hill. I like my man Bonky's ice cream way back here. That's the best ice cream on the planet. If you don't know what I'm talking about, go home and Google it, and the Lord will change your life. <laughs> but let's pretend just for a moment, church, if we can, let's pretend. You and I are sitting at a table, 
And right in front of me on the table sits a nice warm piece of apple pie with Bunky's ice cream. And let's say the slice of amazing warm crusted uh, uh, apple pie and ice cream slides off the edge of the table and lands right in my lap. Which if you know me is probably not uncommon. And all of a sudden you see it, and you're like, oh my goodness, oh no, stay right where you are, I'll help you, and you go get some paper towels, and while you're in the kitchen, you get me another piece of apple pie, you put some Bonky's ice cream on it, you help clean me up, you feed me my apple pie, and you're like, here you go, if that's you, you have the gift of serving. All right, the apple pie's in my lap. And you're like, oh, man, that stinks. Hey, let me buy you another piece of apple pie. In fact, everybody gets a free piece of apple pie. If that's you, you've got a spiritual gift of giving. Apple pie's in my lap. You're like, well, that's not good. We can fix this. Who's good at baking? You good? Great. You're the baker. You run in the kitchen. You begin to run the kitchen. You're like, let's bake another apple pie. Come on, you get this, you get that. Come on, let's, let's get this all together. Let's get this mess cleaned up, man. You're awesome. Here's what you're going to do. Here's a manual on how you get to, the, to bake an apple pie in 30 seconds. All right, let's get the apple pie out. If this is you, you've got the gift of leadership. Are you tracking with me? The apple pie's in my lap. And you're like, oh, man, that's awesome. You made it fall perfectly in your lap. You're so funny. I just love your sense of humor. I mean, we should all have apple pie in our laps. And you grab your apple pie and you throw it in your lap too. (laughs) If that's you, you're an encourager. Encourage somebody with your apple pie this morning. (laughs) You're like, oh, my brother, I am so sorry. I just wish for once that gravity didn't work against you. You poor soul, I want you to join my freedom group. (laughs) Man, I'm going to pray for you. Heavenly Father, may my brother's wounded heart be healed from this pie of salt. (laughs) If that's you, you've got a gift of kindness on your life. So the apple pie's in my lap again. Imagine that. And you're like, oh, hey, man, I've done some research. And there's a better way to eat apple pie. I'd like to give you three points on how to enjoy apple pie. I've entitled this talk, The Apostle's Pie. If that's you, you've got a gift of teaching. Teach that apple pie sermon in Jesus' name. And finally, you're like, well, what about the gift of prophecy? That's always the one left out. Well, you would have caught the pie before it landed in my lap. (laughs) Duh. Actually, the word prophesy means to proclaim, to tell the truth. You'd be like, dude, if you would have listened to me in the first place, you would have shoved that pie away from the edge of the table. You know, God has, wasn't that fun? Now you know your gifts. And you want some apple pie. Uh, God has gifted us all to be contributors. That's why we love the growth track so much at Freedom Church. It's where you can discover your spiritual gifting, how you were created to make a difference in this world. Some of you have undiscovered gifts that the church and the body of Christ needs. And God is waiting for you to lean in and understand that truth. I'll never forget, as, as the band comes, um, I, remember, I, I remember where I was standing, where I felt it was a sunny night, where I felt like the Holy Spirit prompted me and, and confirmed in me that we were to, to move from Texas to Maryland. And to become a pastor of, of, ch- of this church. And I'm like, I was quick to say yes because, man, it felt so right and so good. But after I confirmed, like, yes, I'm going to do this, I started thinking about OMG. Sundays come around every week. Now... What you have to understand is that at this point in my life, if I preached two Sundays a year, that probably was a lot. Now, I have just signed up for 52 consecutive Sundays. (laughs) Okay, y'all can shout yay all day long, but you should have been me, right? I didn't quite, what sounded good on a Sunday night 
Now it really doesn't sound good anymore. And here's another tricky thing. I'm like, okay, so we need, we need to be preaching. I, okay, I'll try to figure that out. We need, we need like some programming. We need some systems. Oh, and every church needs music. I mean, what's church without worship? I really felt like God was calling me to, to be a part of worship. And I played the bass. I didn't know how cool it would be to play the bass and let there be a worship environment, right? So I called Ben Spell. He was a student in our youth ministry. What a gifted kid he was. I'm, I mean, can I just tell you this? You can learn something from anybody. You can learn something, something from any age. Please always be teachable. Have a humble heart. I called him up. I'm like, man, I need your help. He's like, what do you need? I was like, man, we, we're, we're about to go into an environment where, like, the worship kind of depends on, like, me. He's like, you play bass, right? I'm like, yeah, you know I play bass. All right. He's like, I'm going to teach you a system. And he wrote down some numbers. And I had a little music theory in me. He's like, when you play this note, just know that this chord goes with it. And when you play this note, this chord goes with it. And he kind of wrote down a system. And I'll never forget, a couple months later, I'm standing for the first time, my fingers on a keyboard. And God began to use me in a way that I never thought was possible. Kathy, you were there. You remember those moments, those special days of worship. And God began to build this house on worship. I didn't know that gift was in me, but God began to pull it out of me. Some of you are sitting in this room and you've got special gifts in your life. And all God is waiting on you to say, okay, I need to reach out to someone. I feel this. I believe I can do this. And you take something so practical. And I promise you, God will take your gift and change the trajectory of your life. God will take your gift and change the trajectory of an organization. God will take your gift and use it beyond your imagination. God is calling you to serve in his church. I'm going to close with this. God is calling you to serve as his church. Not only do we serve in the church, it's so important to build each other up. But in Matthew 5, 14, it says, You are the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. Let your light shine. That means to be visible. Not be hidden up under a, a, a lampshade, but to be visible. So the question, do people see anything different in me? In the past seven days, how many people would know by the way that you live that you're different? That you follow Jesus? That it's not all about me? It's not what I'm consuming, but rather it's what I'm contributing. It's what I'm contributing. I want to close with this story. There was this journalist that wrote an article in the Times in England. His name is Matthew Paris. He grew up in Africa, moved to the UK, went to university, and became a brilliant writer and researcher. Matthew was an unofficial expert on African poverty, expert on social systems and tribalism. And Matthew was a devout atheist. And what's crazy is that this article that he wrote was entitled, As an Atheist, I Truly Believe That Africa Needs God. I truly believe that Africa needs God. He wrote about going back to the African country of his childhood and seeing the big difference between secular NGOs and Christian mission and churches. 
and he wrote this. Hear me out. He said, but traveling in Malawi refreshed another belief. One I've been trying to banish all my life. An observation I've been unable to avoid since my African childhood. It confounds my ideological beliefs, stubbornly refuses to fit in my worldview, and has embarrassed my growing belief that there is no God. As a confirmed atheist, I've become convinced of the enormous contribution that Christian evangelism makes in Africa. Sharply different and distinct from the work of secular NGOs, non-government organizations, government projects, and international aid efforts. These alone, he says, will not do. Education and training alone will not do. In Africa, Christianity changes people's hearts. It's bringing a spiritual transformation. The rebirth is real, and the change is good. Amen. And Jesus sets the pace. He's like, guys, my nourishment, my food is coming from a different source. My fulfillment is coming from a different source. My fulfillment, my nourishment, my fueling is doing the will of God who sent me and to finish his work. We are not spiritual consumers, but what are we, church? We're spiritual contributors. Why? Because the church does not exist for me. I am the church, and I was created. I I exist for lost humanity. That's why we do what we do. That's why we call ourselves Freedom Church. That's why we have freedom groups. That's why we want to help you discover your gifts. That's why we want to see people make a difference in this world. Not so that we can brag on ourselves and have a, a great brand. No, so that we can glorify God in the earth. So that we can proclaim the name that's above all name. The name of Jesus can prevail. Amen. Come on, let's all stand, everybody. I want to pray over us. So God... Help us. Help us. And forgive us. If we thought this was about us, oh God, please forgive us. And God, we put our faith in you fresh and anew. God, we lean into your word. We lean into what you're saying. We lean in to what you're calling us to be and do. So God, right now I pray, Lord, that that there would be a fire that would begin to burn in our soul. God, I pray that there would be a fire that would begin to burn in our heart. God, I pray that we could leave differently than the way that we came in. God, I pray, Lord, that you would take this lethargy of maybe what summer has brought us. Maybe we've kind of set you aside. Oh, God, maybe we haven't been into the word or maybe we haven't spent time in your presence. Lord, God, I pray that this Sunday morning we could reset. We could reboot our posture. God, that we can lean into worship today. That we can lean into who you are, God, and, and what you're doing right now in our lives. Oh, God, help us to be desperate for you. God, help us to be desperate for you. God, help us to be desperate for you and nothing else, oh, God. And, God, we know the most fulfilled people that we've ever been around wasn't climbing this, this, this ladder of success in the corporate world. And I, I, don't, I don't demise that. I don't, I don't tear that down, God. But that's not the most fulfilling thing that can happen to a human heart. The most fulfilling thing, God, you said it. Jesus, you said it. The most fulfilling thing that I find is when I roll up my sleeves and I begin to put others before me. So God, let this be a church. God, let us begin to take that example and put others first. Help us to forgive our enemies. Help us to turn the other cheek. Help us to walk upright in a world that wants to destroy everything that's good and holy. It's just the work of the enemy. But we know that greater is he that's inside of me, the church, than he that's in the world. So we praise you and we give you glory in Jesus' name. Can we give God some praise this morning? Come on, church. Come on, let's give our best. Come on, let's give our best this morning. Come on. God, we praise you. We give you glory. We give you honor. There's no one that can compare to you, oh God. 
nothing, nothing. Amen. Man, I pray, I pray that maybe your heart was shifted today. I pray that you leaned into what God may have spoke to you. And if you're a guest, man, we're so grateful that you're here. Please don't forget to stop by our guest center on the way out. We have a gift for you. And thank you so much for your generosity. I'm telling you, church, you, you guys are amazing. And what you do, it just blows my mind at what God can do through you. So let's, let's remain generous. Amen. To, uh, this, that's something that we do here at Freedom Church. We bring back the tithe. So as you leave, you can do that. You can go on and give. or you can, There's these black boxes on your way out. So God bless you guys. Have a great weekend. Have a great Sunday. And we'll see you back here next Sunday.